So yes, welcome to another talk on critical perspectives on technology. This lecture series is a part of my research project on exceptional norms, marginalized bodies in interaction design. My name is Katha Spiel and I'm a Hertha Fernberg postdoctoral scholar at TU Wien, where I research marginalized perspectives on technology to inform critical design and engineering. My pronouns are they, them, and um, my assigned name is if you have any access needs that are not fulfilled right now and um, and that I could still offer, like, um, but I will try to do my best to offer anything, uh, let me know. I will also drop Gopi's slides in just a minute um, as an access copy for you in the chat. Uh, but yeah, today you're not here uh, to hear from me. Today you're here to hear from Gopi. Gopinath Kanabiran is a design educator, HCI researcher, and sexuality rights activist currently working as a postdoc at the Computer Science Department at the IT University of Copenhagen in Denmark. And you can find details of his work also at this address. And I'm going to spell it out too. It's um, Gopikan, G O P I K A N N, uh, dot word, dot wordpress.com. Um, his presentation is titled, um, oh, sorry, I made a mistake in my notes. His presentation is titled More Than Teledildonics and Porn, Looking Back at a Decade of Sexuality Research in HCI. And you can ask questions during and after the presentation in the chat window or whichever way Gopi tells you to. Afterwards, we will all be joined in the discussion led by Ekaterina Osipova and Azadeh Badiejarani. I'm so sorry who are master's students in the science and technology program of the University of Vienna. Um, you can both feel free to like, tell us your actual names. Um, and um, for now, I would just say, Gopi, take it away. Okay, uh, all right. Thank you everyone for being here. There are about 25 people, which is <laughs> quite something. Uh, okay, let's see. I'm going to share my desktop. Excellent. Okay, can everyone see my presentation? Uh, okay, so can someone else admit people inside while I'm giving the presentation? Yeah, thank you. Yes, I will do that. Okay, so I quickly sort of want to go through some stuff and then you know open it open it up for discussion. This is a work in progress. Uh, oh. So I want to talk about me. I'm a queer person of color from India. I've lived and worked in the UK, in, in US and in Denmark before, and currently working at IT University of Copenhagen. I'm a human computer interaction researcher and a feminist social technical researcher. I'm interested in doing design theory. Uh, the main themes of my work over the past 10 years has been about uh, the relationship between knowledge and power uh, and desire, pleasure, and well being. So these are. I'm also a sexual rights activist, so I've done human sexuality related workshops and activist stuff and, you know, doing sex ed classes and stuff like that. I'm also part of diversity and inclusion efforts, in both at the institutional level and at, you know, uh, at the more conference level and stuff like that. So this is a general sort of background about me. Um, about this talk, uh, so I wrote this particular article uh, this is my first research paper, first full paper, and my first Kai paper. Uh, and uh, this came out of my master's thesis. And, and so then it sort of went into my, uh, to become the first paper. It's been 10 years since I've, I've written this paper, and, and it's kind of got quite a traction inside the field. So the, this, this, the starting point for this talk is this paper, right? So I'm kind of looking at a decade of what has happened between 2011 and 2021, right? So I wrote this in 2011 and now it's 2021. So I wanna kind of look at, okay, what has happened in this past 10 years? 
um, when I say I'm going to identify some themes, certain uh, what what kind of advancements have been happening in the field, and also kind of note some of the challenges that are sort of faced in this. Right. Um, this is a work in progress, and I want to uh, explicitly say this is not a survey, which means like you know the. Uh, I haven't covered everything that has been published in the past 10 years. So these are just sort of a personal interest of what I have been following through. And based on that, what are my impressions on this, right? So uh, at the end, I also kind of have a discussion prompt for us. So but after kind of talking about what are the major themes that, that have happened in the past 10 years, I kind of have a discussion prompt for us. That is the structure of the talk. Uh, moving forward, I kind of want to begin with some terminology, right? So because it's going to be useful for us to have a background understanding of what we mean by certain words. Um, so by sexuality, uh, we are kind of talking about it as a broad umbrella term, right? Like so it includes a lot of different things like sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, relationships, all of these are kind of so I'm kind of taking sexuality as an umbrella term over there. And it is also recognized as a very central aspect of being human, right? So it's not, uh, it, it is kind of understood as if you're, if you're trying to define what a human is, one of the central aspects of that is our sexual identities, which includes all of these things, right? So that uh, it comes from uh, the World Health Organization's definition of sexual health. Uh, the second aspect of that is sexuality is experienced and expressed, right? Uh, we fantasies, desires, beliefs, attitudes, values, relationships. So in all of these, we kind of experience gender roles and sexuality roles and, you know, desirable stuff and all of that. The third one is that it is influenced by an interaction of multiple things, right? So we don't take gender as gender by itself. We always kind of understand each aspects of this as an interaction. Uh, and so these three are sort of very important uh, to kind of understand what I mean by sexuality. One, that it is a very central aspect of being human. Second is that it's experienced and expressed uh, both these aspects of it. And then third one is it's an interactional idea, right? Interaction of biology, psychology, social, economic, political, religious, all sorts of stuff, right? So it's kind of trying to understand it as an interactional perspective. <clears throat> Next, we have this idea of sexual rights. What do we mean by sexual rights, right? Sexual rights means people have the right to fulfill and express their sexuality and enjoy sexual health. So for the first time, we kind of have rights as a way to enjoy who you are in your body and how you feel, right? That is, you, you're given, uh, you have, you're born with that right to enjoy who you are and express who you are. So that, that becomes the first part of your enjoying your sexual health. Right. And this comes with the caveat, though. So with the respect for the rights of others and within a framework of protection against discrimination. So your sexual enjoyment is completely OK till the time it is being respectful and not, uh, you know, harming another person. So there is a particular framework within which we kind of frame sexual rights. So this is uh, the ter basic terminology I kind of wanted to cover. There's a little bit more. The next one I want to talk about is the design for sexual well-being. This is very specific to HCI. We put together a workshop and had a lot of people uh, participate in this workshop. And in this workshop, we kind of talk about uh, basically identifying opportunities and critically engaging with challenges. Right. And I'll, give, I'll come to this word, what do we mean by critical? But here, when we talk about this, there is a systemic intervention that we are aiming for while we are designing stuff. And what we mean by systemic intervention is that to create a purposeful change that is actually valued by the people who are affected by that change. So if a particular group uh, wants certain things and we introduce a design change into that community and based on how that particular group evaluates and find it valuable, then we kind of call it a systematic intervention, right? The second part of that is so the first part of it deals with the design, which is the purposeful change. The second part of it is the sexual well being. So, what do we mean by sexual well being? Here, framing sexuality related issues as human rights issues. So, when I say human rights issues, there are two important sort of things that we're talking about. One is that we are addressing social justice concerns that rely on multiple regimes of oppression. 
Now, what do we mean by that is that when we talk about gender, gender is never just gender. Gender is always economic class. Gender is always, uh, you know, racial. Gender is always aged. Gender is always able-bodied. And so there is always multiple things that are happening in terms of how we understand specific expressions and experiences, right? So when we talk about sexual well-being in this particular context, we are talking about uh, issues that are uh, coming out of this multiple regimes of oppression, not just a single sort of a thing. And that's where, as many of you might already know, but I also don't want to assume, uh, it, the idea of intersectionality comes into play, right? So intersectionality. And here, the, the specific idea is that intersectionality helps us to understand differences between and within specific groups, right? So for example, I introduced myself as a queer person of color. So that in already who's worked in uh, different Western settings and stuff like that, right? So that is already means that I'm occupying several parts of the Venn diagram and also kind of how I occupy those parts really depends on context and stuff like that right so this kind of complex reality that we all occupy multiple things at multiple times and we all want to act in different ways in the, on the way we sort of you know contextually sit so that is a more sensitivity towards this design for sexual well-being uh, thing that happened in Kai as a workshop so I want to give you a moment to read this particular quote Could you read it out loud too? Just or should I do that? Maybe. Um, sure, sure. Go ahead. Go just ahead. Just for accessibility. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, consider a bird cage. If you look very closely at just one wire in the cage, you cannot see the other wires. If your conception of what is before you is determined by this myopic focus, you are unable to see why a bird would not just fly around the wire any time it wanted to go somewhere. It is only when you step back stop looking at the wires one by one microscopically and take a macroscopic view of the whole cage that you can see why the bird does not go anywhere and then you will see it in the moment. It is perfectly obvious that the bird is surrounded by a network of systemically related barriers, no one of which would be the least hindrance to its flight, but which by their relations to each other are, a confined, uh, are as confining as the solid walls of a dungeon. And the quote is by Marilyn Fryer in 1983, The Politics of Reality, Essays in Feminist Theory. All right. Thank you, Kata. So this is a really nice metaphor that I like to bring up when we talk about intersectionalities, right? So when we think of these sort of multiple regimes of oppression, oh, uh, sorry. When we think of these multiple regimes of oppression, like it's it's it sort of talks about it how as, as these networks of systematically related barriers, right? So when, for example, able-bodiedness and ageism and and say racial privileges and economic status privileges and these sort of stuff, right? So when we have these sort of multiple regimes, how are these kind of forming a network so that someone cannot get out of that particular oppressive thing that they are currently suffering and being exploited for. So the, the emphasis here is not necessarily that if you secure, like, you know, it, one is that it is all interrelated. Second is that the, the harm comes from the fact that they intersect. It is about the relation to each other and not necessarily just the individual itself, right? So how does one interact and sort of make that solid connection so that it becomes like a cage? So. This is a very important quote that I sort of use while talking about intersectionality. Um, so then finally, we want to talk about critical, what I mean by the word critical. So here I want to begin by saying that like, you know, critique that does not offer hope becomes well-informed cynicism, right? So we can sort of find fault and tell accurately what is wrong with the world. But if you just do that, that in itself is not critique. So the idea here is that critique has to offer some kind of hope. And if it doesn't, then it becomes cynicism. So here we kind of have two elements of critique. One is the diagnosis of the past to the present. What is the problem right now? Why is this a problem? And who is this a problem for? Right, so this is the first part 
where we do an explanation and diagnosis of what is the problem and stuff like that. The second part is the prognosis for the future. Now that we know what is the problem, what are we going to do about this? What sort of actions can we do given based on whatever that limited resources or actions or agencies that we have? Right. So critique has these both elements where on the one hand, you kind of try to figure out and diagnose what is wrong with the current setting and why is that contributing to a problem. On the other hand, you also kind of provide this generative future hopeful sort of suggestions for actions. What ought we to do? How to change for better? And who benefits from these sort of changes, right? So that's why it says a critical social theory should always do so in the name of a better future and a more humane society. So when we critique something, we are critiquing it in order to make society a better place, not just to tear down things, right? So we are advocating for a more humane society. That is the goal of critique. Uh, and so in order to do that, we have to maintain a sense of hope, uh, right? So that is what I mean by critical. So that is the terminology that we talked about, a bunch of you know, terminology already. Um, now I want to talk about uh, a decade of sexuality. Uh, there is the Foucault quote. Uh, when I wrote this, uh, there wasn't the allegation, but we are going to acknowledge that and keep moving. Um, so basically what Foucault talks about is like how sex is put into discourse, but as in like, you know, how it's not necessarily about the actions, but about how is it that we understand sexual actions? How is it that we talk about sexual actions? How are we allowed to talk about sexual actions in specific contexts? Right? So in that particular paper that I wrote in 2011, uh, we wrote that sexuality can be raised explicitly, implicitly, or through its absence, right? And we also noted that in, in the field of HCI, we are still not comfortable talking about sexuality outside the purview of romantic relationships. Uh, that is as if like premarital sex or extramarital sex or casual sex or sex work, like these are all things that are, we are very uncomfortable talking about. Uh, most of the times when people talk about intimacy, it is still very much as a romantic relationship sort of a talk, right? So we are still not comfortable talking about those things. And we also advocated for recognizing HCI as an expert domain of sexuality and technology. Uh, and I think uh, the good thing is over the past decade about, I would say at least more than 100 to 130 works have come. So that means that this HCI is now uh, officially an expert domain of sexuality in some ways, I would say, because none of the other fields have this kind of uh, research um, in them as far as I know. So I kind of identified these five themes as the big advancements that have sort of happened in the past uh, 10 years, right? So you can see that in the top there are three and then the bottom there are two. The top three are what I would call like more research has happened. Therefore, there are a bit more major themes and I will sort of go into details about what they are and stuff like that. Um, whereas the bottom two ones are more like, you know, uh, some works are, have happened, but it is also very few. And I also believe that because of the nature, for example, policy and infrastructure or theory and critical practice, these are things that sort of progress in a much slower, so research progresses in a much slower pace than uh, building prototypes and having empirical work and all of those kind of stuff, which is what the top three are uh, so, you know, more into. So these are the five, you know, five sort of themes that uh, I kind of looked at. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize this is not a systematic survey. So there could be other works and, you know, and of course, some of the works can bleed over in different things and all of that. This is just to make sense of a bunch of mess. Here are five things that let's talk about. So that is, that is how I want you to take this, right? So I'm going to just talk about the first three of them. Um, the first one is intimacy and erotics, where they the main themes here are like pleasure and bodily sense making and multimodal interactivity and identity, right? So it's using your entire body and different senses, not just visual, but like touch and uh, sound and, you know, those kind of stuff and trying to understand how multimodal interactivity uh, plays into intimacy and erotics and stuff like that. 
some of the major advances here are mostly technology media to intimacy and pleasure, right? So you have things like work, uh, research on online dating, sex toys, building intimacy in relationships and long distance relationships and stuff like that. Uh, and intimacy here can be both sexual and non-sexual, right? Um, and when we say intimacy, it is a very interesting sort of place, right? Because it can, it, intimacy can be anything from uh, a couple sharing their calendar, uh, to people living in long distance, sending each other love poems to, uh, you know, like a grandma and grandchildren sharing a hug pillow to write like so intimacy kind of is this very plastic concept that that sort of can be both sexual and non sexual and stuff like that. And it involves a lot of different things like managing privacy shared decision making consent and all of those kind of stuff. The challenges for this particular thing is mostly about cultivating healthy erotic exploration and sex positive attitudes. For example, right now, there are not a lot of works that explore disability and disabled people's sexual needs and desires and stuff like that. Um, there's also not much work, but some work is still coming up. Recently, they started the gaining traction on sexual well-being of elderly people as well, like, you know, how what are their intimacy needs and stuff. There's lots of challenges about bodily norms and beliefs, right? Especially if someone is sick or how we see someone with chronic illness and how that plays into desire and, and sexuality. Those are all things that are not normally talked about. Um, so these are the challenges that uh, researchers working in this particular area uh, kind of have, right? And of course, there are a lot of other things, but you know, I've just highlighted some of them here. So next I wanna move to sexual labor and reproductive rights. Um, here, the main themes are about care work and doing effective labor, uh, sec understanding sexual transactions and how bodies are governed, how our bodies are governed, right? So the main advancements here are about how to understand the economics of desire and understanding sexual rights as human rights. Uh, so this includes things like working with sex workers, community organizations, grassroots organizations, uh, trying to understand and reduce gender-based discrimination in software design or other sort of, you know, appropriate places, regulation of public health services like, you know, HIV medication, HIV treatment and support and stuff like that. So this includes, uh, you know, maternal health uh, and menstrual health and sex education and these sort of areas where uh, it is more about the bodies and how those bodies are governed and how the bodies have access to health services and stuff like that, right? Some of the main challenges here are countering exploitative and intersective systems of oppression. So intersectionality and intersectional systems of oppression is something that repeatedly comes up in these sort of uh, works, uh, researchers who work in this area. Um, how do we empower vulnerable groups through participation? Like, you know, how can we sort of share privileges when we can and stuff like that? One of the things that is not talked about and uh, at least research wise so far that I probably, I don't know if something has been written about it, but um, when I chat with my other researcher friends who do this sort of work is this idea of care burnout, uh, right? So when researchers are working in, in, in with say for example, sex workers or domestic abuse victims or people like that, we are sort of, doing some way you have to care and give care in in some ways right and and one of the things is that it like it's very human to feel burnt out uh, and and that goes both for the people who are doing sexual labor and for the researchers who are involved with those kind of people right so there is not much that is talked about a very real problem which is care burnout um, and how do researchers who do care work uh, and talk about doing care work and, you know, all of that kind of stuff, uh, what can we do to what sort of institutional supports can we have about when care by what happens and stuff like that. I, that's not, it's still talk, it's still almost treated as a private issue. If someone is burnt out, they have to go and take time out and figure it out with the therapist and, you know, pop a pill and then come back to work, right? It's not talked about as a systemic issue and, and uh, as a systemic work that we all have to do, right? Like, you know, um, so that is a big 
problem right now, but we will come back to that later during the discussion, I guess. The third theme is sexual violence and rehabilitation. Uh, here, the themes primarily are sexual violence, reducing harmful sexual practices, and, and uh, trying to have bodily autonomy and integrity. Right. So some of the advancements here are like equipping high risk populations for self defense, having safety options, uh, protection from and education about various forms of sexual violence, including domestic partner abuse uh, and, and other forms of sexual violence as well. Right. Uh, the interventions include like having crisis intervention, healthy portrayals of sexual pleasure, teaching safety and consent uh, to, to people. So these are all sort of you know, efforts in, in handling sexual violence and rehabilitation. Some of the challenges of this is physical and emotional safety, right? Uh, physical and emotional safety of both the subjects and again of researchers as well. Um, I mean, end of day we like you know you have to be a professional and do your work and all of that kind of stuff but also sitting and interviewing someone who has gone through something very horrible uh is not something that is to be taken lightly uh it, it you know you have to get some level of professional uh, qualification to handle those things so that you can be of help and but also more importantly take care of yourself as well um, right. So again, when going back to that uh, big long spiel I gave about being critical uh, about critique having hope uh, is that when we get exposed to all of these sort of uh, very heartbreaking, exploitative, inhumane things that our research participants have gone through, there is a part of you that loses hope and feels awful and feels helpless and lost. And so this having to maintain your sense of hope so you can keep going is extremely important. And that includes our own emotional safety and how we feel uh, during these things as well, right? So there is ideas of researcher responsibility, trauma response. How do researchers, how can researchers respond to trauma and, and that sort of stuff? What should be our role in asking those things? One of the things which I find a little bit disappointing, uh, but also understandable is that there is currently no efforts for rehabilitating offenders. Um, almost all of the uh, you know, technology technological research interventions and design interventions for helping the victims and stuff like that, which is great. But also when we think about it as a long-term solution, right? Like what are we supposed to do with these offenders and how do we stop them from repeat offending? And, and uh, how can we sort of humanely have and humanely discuss this issue, right? So there is no discussions or no sort of rehabilitations that I am aware of uh, Kata has... Again, yes, I'm sorry. I have to like just briefly. It's not framed under this kind of like um, frame, so it's very like understandable why you may not have um, caught it with that. But there is work by Rosanna Bellini. Um, uh, one second. Uh, this person. Okay. Uh, who um, who is in the midst of finishing her PhD? Um, okay. Uh, who is doing that exact work right now. So it's just like an oh. add on uh, to like, this has happened and like, um, uh, but it's only one person that I know of and that's not really a lot, right, either. No, but but I'm glad it, it is happening. So I'm um, see this is I'm extremely glad that it's happening and 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 because I think that is a very important part of uh, addressing this issue in the long term, right? So I, I and I'll also talk about why that is important as a feminist as well. But uh, but I will add that to my notes and and thanks for mentioning that during the talk, Kata. Um, so. Thank you. Okay, so that's sort of the theme three, uh, which is the sexual violence and rehabilitation. So these are the main sort of bigger advancements, the three big sort of areas of advancements that have happened in HCI in the past 10 years. And as you can see, all three of them are very extremely important in, in very, very uh, interesting ways. Um, 
So now what I want to kind of do is I have a uh, two slides for discussion prompt and then I just want to open it up. We don't have to talk about these particular prompts. We can talk about anything that, you know, that has sort of happened in the presentation or something that you have relevant. But um, this is where my head is right now. So I kind of want to talk about this and then get your opinion on that. Uh, the first one is kind of thinking about pleasure in the time of Corona, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a play on, on the novel Love in the Time of uh, Cholera. Uh, but here again, Shusterman talks about, we normally think of pleasure as something which is just a extra add-on or something as, a, you know, a just... And, you know, not a very important thing. And then if we talk about pleasure, then people immediately tend to dismiss it as being very hedonistic and, and it's just like mindless pleasure and stuff like that. But here there is a very a different idea of pleasure, which is says that pleasure is actually uh, motivates us to live and, and it, it makes us believe that life is worth living, right? So, and, and I wanna again, come back to this idea of hope and connect that with pleasure. When we have small pleasures in our life, even when we are burnt out, even when we have, uh, you know, when we are exposed to all the awful things, the small pleasures in our life kind of remind us life is still worth living. Um, so we, I want to connect, come back very strongly, connect to that, uh, that in these times of Corona, where you know we are so emotionally exhausted, everyone's so burnt out, and all of these kind of stuff can we come back to this idea of pleasure and, and use pleasure as a way of reaffirming our own lives, right? And then it says the pleasures, the emotional positive surge encouragingly opens us to new experiences and to other people, right? So pleasure also can help us become more open-minded and be a bit more open to other people who probably have different values and opinions and judgments than we do. And then here, is a quote which sort of talks about how we understand our body, uh, that our body is always a body in relation uh, and is always uh, socially situated. And what we mean by that, that is like right from our birth, we are always related to another person's body. And we share this time and space till we die with other people's body. Uh, so to always, come back to this understanding of like the body is the living site and material condition of sociality and vice versa where the sociality is inconceivable without bodies in relation. So understanding body as always bodies in relation to each other, right? Uh, and again, bringing that to pleasure. So uh, this, sec this is the last slide where Femin pleasure as a feminist praxis, right? So we kind of think about like, okay, if feminists are doing different kinds of activism and changing the world and all of this kind of stuff, can pleasure be a way of changing the world? Uh, can, can enjoying pleasure and, and feeling hope and all of that, right? So here I kind of talk about pleasure is something that can help us to have these opportunities and moments of self-growth in relation to another person. Uh, we, might, we might be very afraid of someone, but when we have a pleasurable experience, not necessarily sexual, but just a pleasurable experience, then we open up our, our perceptions and we become more open to that person and what they have to say and our ideas and stuff like that. So there is self-growth which happens in relation to another person. And that's kind of where I talk about, again, going back to this idea of bodies in relation. Here we are thinking about intercorporeal becomings, which is another way of saying one becomes in relation to the touch of a lover, right? So who do we become when we are touched by a person who loves us? Uh, as opposed to just asking, who is this person? Who am I? And the self as just an individual for individual sake, right? So here, understanding self in terms of touch and pleasure and in terms of positive sort of relationship with other people. So that is where I want to stop. Thank you so much. I'm I'm gonna stop the recording because there might be like you know, kind of a sure. intimate uh, discussions to be had.